Well, Kojo, it's a, it's a great pleasure actually to be here in Australia and um, have a conversation with you about issues which you and I have both discussed um, with others for quite a while. Um, the theme of this conference is succeeding beyond borders. And it's a great theme because it's about success, but also about being borderless. And where I come from, essentially, as I look at it today, um, I am a Pan-Africanist who could, through ancestral roots, possibly have rights to passports of five countries, four in Africa and two in the Caribbean, because of my, my, you know, my ancestors married interculturally. Now, you're someone who operates between Europe and Africa. Um, you also have links to at least two African countries, but also you're globally very active. How would you today, in light of this theme, Succeeding Beyond Borders, how would you define citizenship? What does it mean to you, really? Yeah, thanks, Max. Um, I think that's a very interesting question and one I think about a lot. I think um, if you, when you ask different people where are you from, you get very different answers. So in my case, um, I'm born in Geneva. So some people would say, oh, you're Swiss. But I, I certainly don't think I'm Swiss. Um, um, <laughs> some, some people do decide that they are where they're born is, is where they're from for many people. Other people is where they live. And um, again, in my case, I've lived in Geneva, New York, London, Lagos, Accra. Um, and then other people is where your parents are from. Um, in my case, my dad is from Ghana. Many people know, but also my mom is from Nigeria. So I feel very much from both places and hence being very much an African. So I can very much uh, relate to the topic. Um, and often both countries try to drag me from one side to the other. And um, it can be quite heated in our debates. And people from many of those countries know that we have this uh, jollof wars. <laughs> and um, they argue about who makes the better jollof. And it can get quite heated. But it's a microcosm of how we feel. You should be from one side to the other. And I genuinely feel from both countries. You know, um, I'm very much attached to both. I don't let myself be defined by one or the other because I'm from both. And I think that that embodies the spirit of Africanism. Um, so as she said, you know, she, she lives in Australia and feels very much Australian, but she feels African. So I've grown up as a Londoner as well. So I very much feel like I'm from London, lived there for many, many years. But at the core, I'm from the continent. And um, the topic, I think, embodies that you can be wherever you, you can reside somewhere but where you're from is more to do with your culture, your upbringing, your heritage, and the, the upbringing that comes from your parents and your ancestors. And how you embody that or portray that to others is, reflects on where you're from. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you, you, you've led me down a, an, an alley here. I totally understand if you were asked who makes the best jollof in Accra, mm -hmm. what you would say, and also what you'd say if you asked who makes the best jollof in Lagos. But you're in London and you've gone out somewhere, and there's two different jollofs there, Ghanaian and Nigerian. And you're asked by an Australian, who makes the best jollof? What do you say? I will say my mum. <laughs> <laughs> by that answer, you can tell he's an Anand. <laughs> um, given said that, having, having said that, once people are away from their own country, what should the host community be doing? Yeah. Um, I think the host communities should be giving them opportunity. Um, I think most people from Africa, wherever, wherever they've ended up, um, given the opportunity are prepared to work hard for a better future for themselves, for their families. They've often come a long way to other places striving for a better future and looking for the opportunity to develop themselves, enhance their skill sets, um, and often take what they've, what they've gained, either in material sense or in terms of knowledge, and share that um, with their family or friends or community back home. I think that transfer of knowledge and know-how is critical. Um, we see it um, financially in terms of remittances, which a lot of people 
were sleeping on, but we've now seen, um, they even had an article recently in the FT that remittances this year globally is going to touch um, almost $700 billion from the diasporas of the world, and a large chunk of that is from Africa. Um, and that's not even factoring in the money that goes by cash, which is not, which is not captured, so that, that's probably over a trillion dollars being sent home, and that's now overtaken foreign direct investment into the continent. So the power of the diaspora and what they represent before was unheralded, but now, theoretically, they could be the most significant group for the continent. So, so the role you play outside of Africa, you're also becoming an ambassador for the continent because if I'm Australian, the first thing I know about Africa is what I see here in front of me today. So you act as ambassador to the country, but also the host community ID needs to give them the platform for their potential skill sets to flourish and um, remove the barriers to entry and make it meritocratic for people to rise up in their various fields or professions. It seems to me that there's, there's two issues here as well. There's how uh, host communities are able to basically relate to Africans who've come, but also at the same time, how there can be a link with regarding the host community and where people have come from. Now, this year, Ghana has declared the year of the return. Okay. I'm wondering, I mean, you're a Ghanaian, mm -hmm. operate out of London, also of Nigeria. What do you make of that? And what do you think other countries can learn from that in terms of how to harness both the historic diaspora, but also the most recent diaspora to give as much as possible to Africa as is now you know, rising? Yeah, well, I think um, the year of the return in Ghana so far, I think has been a great success. I think it's going to get even more successful as we lead up to the Christmas and New Year period. I think um, the president of Ghana, like yourself, like myself, is a pan-Africanist, and he very much believes um, in, in Krumah's vision. And I think the basis on which he hosts the year of return is obviously was this year's marking 400 years of the commencement of the transatlantic slave trade, but also that led to a dispersed and broken set of people who all came from one continent and one place. And we all know the history of how they've been divided and suffered great atrocities over the years. And I think it was a calling for us to come together. Um, he recently, the president again recently said in a speech that whichever country you're from, be it in Africa, be it in the US, Brazil, um, Europe, um, as a black, you're from Africa, and that's where you come from. I think it's a message of unity, and that um, together you're stronger, and um, when we come together and act collectively, we can achieve more. So I think he's had a great success, particularly in the US, of many people coming and wanting to come to Africa and retrace their roots, have the connection to where they're coming, where they're coming from, see the heritage and the history, and then see how they also collectively can play a part in the development of the continent. Um, I think that is, that is the, the heart of the year of the returns. It's not just for them to visit once, but then for them to almost fall back in love with where they're, where they're originally from, embrace it, and see what they can do to add value. There's been also a lot of talk about the, the narrative, what it means to return, and you know, what, what, what Africa represents to those who are of the historic diaspora. Uh, we have to be honest with ourselves that for a while there's been, that there's been a feeling that the people could not actually return and feel at home. Yeah. A lot of African Americans, a lot of Caribbean felt that they couldn't go back and feel at home. But we've seen some change in recent years with the whole, uh, the music. The music has been The key. crossover of the music. I mean, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of the whole cultural and sports uh, links mm -hmm. between the continent and the di diaspora. Yeah, I think um, you made a very good point about the the music, the sports, these tend to be the um, cultural ambassadors. For people that don't know much about your countries, these are the first things they see. I mean, when, when I was um, growing up in London, the first thing I knew about Australia was um, uh, Steve Waugh and Merv Hughes. These were cricketers, um, Shane Warne. That's what I knew about. And then I knew Neighbours, and you had um, <laughs> Kylie Minogue. And that was what I knew about Australia. And then later, of course, you, you learned many other things. So I think the first things people now, before, when I was growing up, you know, we used to shy away from our Africans proudly being Nigerian, proudly Ghanaian. But now, if you're a young person, 
you have WizKid and Burner Boy and David O, and these, these sounds are growing globally. The world is hearing our rhythm and our beat, and then you're proud to say, that those are my people. And the same thing in film, fashion, sports, if it's a drug bar, you know, if it's um, a Chiwetel or a David or Jay in architecture. So there's so many examples, Chimamanda writing wonderful stories. So the young people can associate with that and proudly say, these are, these are my people. And um, they're great ambassadors for you and everybody can see the level of excellence that they achieve. Let's linger a little bit now on the issue of sports. I know you are very passionate about sports. Australians are passionate about sports. Some would say the, the Australians are actually obsessed about sports. Um, I'm wondering what your take is in terms of not just sports as being sports and entertainment, but regarding sports, you mentioned the word excellence, sports and, and, and leadership is what sports can actually do away from the sporting field in terms of bringing people up. Yeah, well, I think I'm, I'm passionate about it because apart from loving playing, I think it's, it's, the number, it's arguably the number one unifier in the world that people come together for sports. So even if we use Africa as a continent, we're often very divided. As I said, I'm from Nigeria, you're from Kenya, he's from Ghana, you're from Senegal. But um, when Drogba scores, we're all African. You know, everybody forgets the barriers and they come Unless he scores against Ghana. Unless he scores against Ghana, <laughs> true, true. But um, it brings them, to, it brings people together. So I think it plays a strong role of unity but also um, the excellence is evident for all to see. So if someone's the fastest in the room, there's no barrier to entry. You can't say, oh, because you're from this tribe, you're not in. The guy can move from A to B faster than everybody else, so he's clearly the best. And the meritocracy of sport is what I like because if you're the best at what you do, you can reach the top. In some other fields, we can argue that you have barriers to entry. Um, as you and I talked um, at lunchtime, I think, that. Um, um, my father used to teach me when I used to say, oh, so-and-so didn't get this job because of this, or you start, start feeling, oh, it's because of racism or because of that. I think um, a message that we often forget is that uh, people often like to work with people that remind them of themselves. It's just human nature, um, whether we like it or not. So if I am an, uh, an Italian-American, I meet a young Italian-American boy, he reminds me of myself when I was 17. I think, oh, maybe I'll hire him as opposed to this guy from Ghana that I have no idea where he's coming from. Um, and we can't deny that fact, that, that that plays a factor. But in areas like sports, the excellence will always supersede. And um, if we try and apply that excellence to everything we're doing in our works of life, I think Oprah Winfrey says excellence is the best deterrent to racism. You have to keep pushing the barrier to keep excelling so that you can bring those behind you after you because you've, you've stepped up and then they've seen that you're capable and you've changed the narrative by what you do. Are there any particular uh, initiatives in this realm that, that inspire you at the moment? Um, yeah, there's a few, um, there's several, um, I would call them leadership academies coming up on the continent that are marrying sports and education. I, I go on about sports a lot because again, back home, particularly on the males, and, but increasingly with the women, as, with the young ladies as well, a lot of young kids think sports is their way out. And despite me talking about the excellence, of course, 99% of them are not gonna be the next drug bear. Mm -hmm. So they need to be pushed towards education. And there's quite a few academies now that are using the sports and marrying it with the education. So they're being incentivized by the thing they're passionate about but now matching it with education to know that they have a fallback position, but then they get some of the key lessons for life from the sport in terms of determination, hard work, discipline, teamwork, leadership, um, respects of the rules of the game, and so on and so forth. And these are all critical life skills that you can apply regardless of whatever your field is. Mm -hmm. That said, in, in many countries, and Australia is one of them, there was a time where there wasn't much of meritocracy because certain, certain people were held back because of the, the color of their skin. You can look at some, some teams around the world where if you're black, you couldn't play. And then suddenly once they changed things and allowed their, their African or their black community to be more part of it, they started to win. Australia, we all know, had a kind of white Australia policy for many years where black people even come and settle here. 
Uh, things have changed, but there's still lingering racism of, you know, no in this country. I'm, I'm wondering, someone who's visiting for the first time, but you've read about it, you've heard about it, what, what, what would you think um, could be or should be done to enable the diaspora, the African diaspora here in Australia, to play a, a greater, more um, impactful role in this country? Um, I think that, um, as I said, it's my first time to Australia, yeah. so I can't give you deep analysis yeah, yeah. on the um, Australian mindset, but I think a lot of what you said applies in many other countries as well. There is a lingering racism. A, a lot of it is often based on um, what I'll call um, lack of exposure. A lot of it is more ignorance. A lot of racism is ignorance, in my experience, as opposed to just pure racism, because people just don't understand. They've never met people like us. They've never come across us. And that's why I said you have to be the ambassador of yourself because you can either sit and dwell on the past or you can be the change maker. And the more of you they see excelling and doing well in society, the more others, the youth coming behind you will do the same as you. And then the more the viewpoints of those not like you will change. So the more times they see a, another Obama coming or a Tijan Tiam who's running Credit Suisse or a Bayo Gunlesi, and countless others who are excelling, not on the sports, if I just use it as an example, but excelling in business or in medicine or in science or in arts or in um, literature, fashion, film, the more excellence they see, the more that changes the narrative and the more you become seen as, as a role model. And the more role models you create, the more your children believe that they can be anything they want to be. And that wasn't the case years ago where many young black people felt they could only be in a certain box. You have a name that's globally recognized. I mean, you're also a man in, in your own right. But if you were to sit down with, say, someone who's an influential Australian politician right now, what, to build on what you just said, what would you say to, to try and kind of open some more doors in, 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 that, in, in, that, way, in that regard? Um, Concretely. Yeah, it's hard. I, I think that, you know, they have to create... Um, genuine partnerships um, and genuine pathways. I think that um, coming from Africa, you also, the flip side is that you know that many countries, including Australia, many companies have come into to the continent and benefited greatly from the resources on the continent. So you'd want to see something whereby there's, there's a genuine positive giving back, not in um, theory and not just um, with words, but with concrete actions, whereby it could be, you could develop programs that they could specifically support, as in, again, focusing on this area of excellence. If you have brilliant young Africans, um, there could be scholarship programs, it could be leadership programs, they could invest in leadership academies, whereby you have a, a, a two-way pathway. They train the best people here, and they can also then go back to the continent and serve there, perhaps in mining companies or organizations, but with skill sets and knowledge they've learned here. Mm -hmm. So, but it has to be a genuine partnership, no longer the um, aid of the past. I think we've, we've gone past that. And I think most of the young people don't want that anymore. They want this new narrative that she was talking about. Um, it's a continent full of creativity, irrepressible young people, and they should be given the, the platform to flourish. Mm -hmm. But this will be done through concrete actions, whereby there's real programs that we can demonstrate and see mm -hmm. and measure the, the impacts. Yeah, I totally agree. And I like the, the, the introduction this afternoon about the, 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 the narrative. Mm -hmm. Because I think that as human beings, what really has helped us develop and transform on this planet is the whole way we deal with stories. It's really about stories, because stories help to inspire people, but also stories can hold people back. 100%. And from my own work, I mean, I worked for 11 years with the BBC um, as, as a producer and a presenter there, and then later on with the UN, speech writing. I realized the power of the narrative. And often as Africans, uh, we have allowed others to dictate the narrative to us. And also we've, also we've told ourselves things which have held us back. And so really it's time now to change the narrative. The, uh, 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 we had a slide before of the Economist um, cover, uh, Hopeless Continent and Africa Rising. I knew the editor who was responsible for both of them. However, he denied years later having been responsible for the first one, <laughs> uh, you know, it being a hopeless continent. But also I worked with, I had the honor of working with your father for many years in Geneva on the Africa Progress Panel. And one thing we always did there was to make sure that the narrative had to be one which was an African-owned one, African-led one, and one in which we always said, your father always said that 
Africa is not a poor continent. It's a rich continent with many poor people in it. Why? And then we have to then disaggregate why they are poor and try and inspire people to get themselves out of that situation, that, that mindset. But having said that, I'd like to take this to the floor now and see if there are any questions regarding what Kojo and I have dis discussed so far. And they, maybe we can open it up a bit and be a bit more um, interactive here in terms of um, what we've been discussing. Hi, Kojo. It's good to have you in Australia. Thank you very much for making the time. We have a kind of narrative at the family level where we have children who, for no much reason of, or cause of theirs, they are struggling with the narrative. So I think it's a, it's a good privilege. I call it a blessing to have someone like you right now who can speak to them. So take this as a moment, which I think is precious. What would you say to our children? Thank you. Um, yeah. As a father yeah. and as a son, yeah. what would you say to the, the young people? No, I think, um, I mean, that's a very broad question. But I think um, just following on from the, 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 the points that we were making earlier, I think you, we need to encourage our children to be the best that they can be, to understand that there's no ceiling whatsoever in life. That's a narrative, that's a false narrative that was created. Um, no matter where they're from, no matter their current circumstance, no matter where they're living, if they work hard, study hard, put in the best they can be, then the possibilities for them are limitless. Um, you live in a world of technology now, so things are being leapfrogged faster than, than we can imagine. And um, as a young African, you have the same possibilities to create and develop as anybody else does in the world. So even some of the barriers we faced in my generation aren't even there anymore because of te technology and this borderless world that you're living in. So you have to reach for the stars, be the very best that you, that you can be, and there's nothing that can stop you but yourself and the only limitations you create in your own narrative. That's roughly what I would tell them. Thank you. Any questions? Maybe from the very young people at the back? I don't know. Hi. Um, I'll go straight to the point because of time. Um, our subheading is bridging the economies and communities of Australia and Africa. If I'm an everyday African living in Australia, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between what the perceptions we get when we go back home uh, since we've left. And what that's what, what that has done through the ages is built some kind of divide between people in the diaspora and people back home. Say if I'm an, an ordinary everyday person, how can I actually impact things that might happen back home if say I have no position or I'm just an Australian working hard to feed my family? How can I impact what's going on back home as well in a way that's sustainable? Um, because we do care about home, but it's always kind of hard to find out what we can do about the situations happening home. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a very good question. I think there's always been this struggle between, in Nigeria, they say you're an away boy, and um, so there's always a struggle between the home people and, and those in the, in the diaspora. But I think um, what the advantage you have here is that you're living in a first world country, you have access to knowledge and know-how that they might not have. You're seeing things every day around you that they might not know. You're, you're, you're garnering knowledge they might not know, and you might not be in a position of government or influence, but being in the private sector, you can take some of that knowledge and pass it on over there. So it doesn't have to be in financial terms. It can be know-how that you can transfer to others. It can be your family, your friends, your community over there that they can then apply into your hometown or, or your home city. And again, I gave you obvious example. It can be remittances. So it can be financial, or it can be technical knowledge and know-how and transfer of skills that can now help other people who live there you know, apply those skills or that knowledge there to make an impact. I, I want to be blunt in, in, in my return, in my, my um, response to that. I think that part of the problem is where home and people at home feel insecure about the returning 
you've gone, you've made something yourself. Um, there might be some jealousy, some resentment. There's always, there's always yeah. jealousy. Yeah. And, but because of, because of that, that response, they're holding everyone back. Mm. Uh, I researched this. If you look at uh, communities, for example, say China, where you had the overseas Chinese and then coming back, India, over the last, say, 30 years, the way, when they changed the way they, they dealt with the Indians who had gone back and were going back into India, um, the Lebanese, their diaspora, those countries that have, and those regions that have, that have base, basically said, we're going to do a diff, have a different way of dealing with our diaspora, have boomed. They've boomed, yeah. They've really boomed, and it's become a win-win. And it's high time for Africa. I'm saying Africa, I'm a pan-African. Mm -hmm. Not individual countries like Ghana. Yeah, Africa to say, you know what? We have this diaspora, both the recent one, you here, and the historic one, the African-Americans, Caribbeans, the Brazilians. We embrace them, yeah. not just for tourism. We embrace yeah. them, give them passports. Yeah. They can go and come. Yeah? yeah. And therefore, by doing that, we can all grow together. Until we do that, we're going to be holding ourselves back as Africans. Yeah. And, 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 and we're, we're continuing the discourse yeah. of not being united. So first you divide yourself as American, Caribbean, African, then you divide yourself as diaspora African, the one who lived in Australia, and then when you get back home, you divide yourself again as Igbo, Yoruba, or Fancy, or whatever. So it's, it's actually funny because it's continual yeah. division. That's all we do. So it's obvious that you need to get past that, stop creating these divisions, and come together, and then you achieve far more. Exactly. Now the questions are flowing. That's what we like. Yeah. We got it there. All right. Thank you guys for coming in here today and, and throwing some light around you know, how this topic around succeeding beyond borders. A bit louder, borders. please. We can't hear you. Thank you. Yeah, just this topic around succeeding beyond borders is something that I've sort of personally always struggled with because I'm an African. Uh, my question is really, how do you, how can you um, achieve um, something in Africa from Australia, just like it happens in other continents, like other countries like the US and the UK is a lot easier for people to come from there and then do stuff in Africa. But from Australia, it's a bit harder. So how can we actually make a difference in Africa from Australia? Um, it's a good question. I, I think, first of all, you know, it's a very broad question. So you, you're going to have to have specifics as to specific areas that you want to target or focus on. I think um, if you do some research, there's a lot of net, There's now a lot of diaspora networks that I myself am aware of, um, and they're becoming quite global in nature. So often working with networks helps because you, you don't feel like you're on your own. You know, you're with a group of like-minded people. Um, I can introduce you to a few of them that I know, my pad, and a few others that are working with Africans and diaspora globally, but all towards this sort of collective purpose of um, doing something impactful back home. Um, and I think um, you need to find groups that you can work with or a particular area that you want to focus on where you know you can do the, the impact. And then if you do the research, as I said, there's an increasing um, movement towards what you're talking about. And there's young people, particularly in Europe and the US, as you mentioned, but they're increasingly global. They're in Latin America. They're in Asia, and they're all forming networks. And with technology today, WhatsApp, all these groups, they're coming together to collectively impact the continent. And sometimes if you're working in isolation, it's much harder than working with a group. So even this organization you have here today, I met some of your founders. Perhaps you can do some things collectively where you support each other to do certain projects on the continent. And I'll add to that that critical mass is key. One person alone can start something, but you have a critical mass, you can really grow it. And I, I'm someone who's, who's passionate about the power of politics and the power of lobbying. If you're an Australian and you can vote in Australia, that means then together you can also lobby your MP, who can then lobby his party, and so we can then start, start seeing change at the federal level in terms of how you, the federal government engages with Africa. And then you as African Australians can go through that channel because they have ambassadors now in Africa, and then also put pressure on the African governments to make sure that there's that bridge. You've got to think at many different levels, but politics is very important. Use that voice that you have as African Australians to make the change you want to see. Because when you're doing it, it's not just aid. You're doing it as someone who's an Australian and an African. And you're going to make real transformation rather than someone's just ticking a box to say, we give X amount of money to an African country. Mm -hmm. There's a lady at the back. 
Oh, you saw you. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. My 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 question is a is a leadership question, and I've been following your your leadership journey recently uh, when I heard you were coming to Australia, and it's quite impressive. Um, we have a lot of emerging leaders, young leaders in the audience today. And I just want to echo uh, what you spoke about with Max. Um, we call it tall people syndrome in Australia. In Africa, it's also known as PhD. And also, uh, I call it the crab mentality. Um, a lot of young people are disheartened when sometimes they want to do something and they are not supported. They don't feel supported. So my question is, as a leader, you've been there. What advice can you give the young emerging leaders in the room today to remain resilient and to remember their why? And to remember? Their why, why they're doing something, and to excel, to excellence. Well, I think you hit a key word there, resilience. I think you'll see anybody who's had success will tell you it didn't come, come easy. Um, again, um, using a sports, the sports analogy, you always see the top players will tell you, you see the people when they score the goals and everyone celebrates, but you don't see the hours and years and months of hard work that they put in before. So if, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So to be a leader, you're going to go through tough times. That comes with being a leader. And if you can't handle that, then perhaps leadership is not necessarily the right role for you. The, the, the key component is what you just said about is resilience. All other qualities can come on top and, and embellish, but if you don't have the determination and the resilience, you will come across hardships. It's just the, the nature of the beast that you're dealing with. I'll also add that um, leadership is about people, right? So although you're trying to manage upwards, horizontally, you also need to make sure you've got who, are, who is it that you're leading and have a good relationship with people, you know, and humility, because there, there, there comes, lies the power to bring the change. If you have people with you, no one can stop you. Yeah. So even if you're 18 years old and you're leading a student's union, if you're doing the right thing for those people behind you, you can make the change you want to see. You can, but alone you can't. Yeah. You've got to be that Ubuntu spirit. You have yeah. to have people with you. It has you. to be unity, it has yeah. to be unity. And the, the collective action always outdoes the individual action. So you'll always achieve more as a collective. Just, I, I think um, one of your slides here talked about the, um, the free trade agreement that's recently been signed. So I think we do have to recognize there are some positive steps being made in the right direction. I think we have um, ECOWAS as an example where with the ECOWAS passport, you can travel within uh, 16 countries. And there is work being done at the African Union with a view to an African passport. Um, I don't know how far away we are from that, but there is serious work and consideration being done with a view to an African passport that will allow you know, us to finally see ourselves as one continent. And you can travel from Cape Town to Cairo, from Lagos to Nairobi um, on one passport. Um, and that's the vision that we're driving towards. But I do agree with you, it, it is difficult right now. And we're still so, so um, segregated and separated. And um, it's going to take continual lobbying from the likes of yourselves and the, and the other young people to push these governments to see the, the need to broaden the passports and the ability to travel within and amongst ourselves. And just to add to that, I mean, you, you touched on the, the, the visa and the traveling, but talking about issues related to dual citizenship. Yeah, um, and it's something I was, I was addressing earlier. Ghana, Nigeria, uh, and say even Ethiopia, where there's no dual citizenship, which, but has a special kind of card, which like the Indians have, which is an overseas Indian. It, since they've done that, opened those doors, money has come in. Mm -hmm. So I think those countries like Tanzania and others, which for other historic reasons might still be very closed, are. Are, are holding themselves back. Yeah. I think the more you can do to make it easier for the diaspora to feel that they can come, go, and whatever, and still be part of home and part of where they've gone, gone to, the more you'll be able to benefit both countries. But that can only be done through lobbying by the diaspora on the home governments. No foreign government can make that change. So it's up to you to really 
push for that. Too. Yeah, I think the president of Ghana has recently also allowed them um, for the African Americans mm -hmm. coming the right of abode, which has also seen a huge yeah. upsurge in them coming, which, as Max is saying, will now lead to investment yeah. into your country. People might want to buy a second home, invest in real estate, and the impact on the economies do become significant. And I was so personally so pleased because one of my favorite actors is Samuel L. Jackson. Mm -hmm. I don't know who all saw that recently he went to Gabon mm -hmm. and he got his Gabonese passport. Yeah. Because through DNA testing, they found out he was from that, historically yeah. from that region. Yeah. And that's great. If more countries could do that, yeah. then really we're going to change. change Completely. The yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much.